Still, we are recording. British audiences have been settling down to watch situation comedies on sofas or in TV studios for nearly 50 years. And in many ways, nothing has changed. Three, two, one, zero. Good luck, everybody. Here we go, then. And action. <laughs> Children's books are great, aren't they? Mm. You don't get a sliding penguin with Emily's so-called Bronte, do you? No, Daisy bitch. Wasn't there something we were supposed to be doing? Oh, yeah. yeah. Over the five decades of its history, situation comedy has turned TV into a distorting mirror, reflecting back at us all the most ludicrous political posturing... Bloody rubbish! ..fashion statements and moral quirks of the day. Let's drink life to the dregs. And with the passing years, each show becomes a kind of time capsule, a slice of comic life, with its own place in the larger story of a changing Britain. Nice weather for the ducks, eh? You're right there, my goodness me. There's more water out there than there is in your beer. <laughs> From Hancock's half hour in the 50s to today's men behaving badly, sitcoms have followed a simple and successful recipe. Scatter a handful of regular characters over two or three small sets, sprinkle with some funny lines, place in front of a live audience, and grill for 30 minutes under studio lights. Forty on one next. Fertilise me, Gary. <laughs> Fertilise me like you've never fertilised me before. And when people laugh, another popular sitcom is born. Hey, wouldn't it be weird if a woman could be made pregnant by a penguin? The meaning of sitcom, I mean, I think, is a, a situation that's supposed to be comedic. Uh, sitcom really is like a soap with laughs. Sitcom, isn't it an awful word? Sitcom. It's like an email address, isn't it? Think <laughs> sitcom dot dot laugh. Sitcom, when it's done properly, is genuinely about comedic situations, not about unfunny situations where people exchange jokes. What you done, you stupid Wait a minute. What? I think it'll be all right. Yes, yes you're right. Oh. <laughs> it's very difficult to define what a sitcom should be because they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, domestic comedies and, and action comedies and, and two people in a room or whatever it might be. I think you've got to have identification. People have got to look into the screen and see a reflection of themselves. They've got to see their own lives reflected on the screen. I must get a plug put on this thing, Rodney. If you've got this vein of reality there, this layer of reality, and then you've got the conflict of different characters pulling away from each other, pulling towards each what other. You You're making out as though your parents are better than mine. Oh, don't be silly, Belle. They're not better. They're just different, that's all. Oh, well, like you and me. I mean, we're not quite the same, are we? The way we speak, for a start. Well, I do it with my mouth. I don't know about you. <laughs> if you've got a spark of humour and fun and drama, if you've got those ingredients, hopefully you've got a good, fun situation comedy. Doesn't guarantee anything there. You can have all those ingredients and it's... <clears throat> Sitcom is X amount of recognisable characters in a recognisable place, um, either domestic or workplace, doing um, extremely recognisable things, only slightly larger than you would in real life and being either slightly more stupid, slightly more clever, slightly more sexual or slightly more neurotic. And that happens week after week. And as long as they don't change too much, you'll be fine. She's going to take that top off any minute. <laughs> it's 
coming off. It's coming off. Coming off. In television terms, soap operas with laughs are as traditional as warm beer and cricket, but in fact, situation comedy is as British as a Big Mac and fries. I have a theory that situation comedy comes from um, a mixture of s American soap opera and American personality shows, like the Jack Benny show, where he would have guest stars and a guest singer, and they would have dialogue, and he would do a monologue, and uh, then they would play a sketch. And I think the American humour people realise that if we just have Jack Benny in a domestic environment, the show that he used to do can be talked about as if it's happening off stage. And that's really how uh, American situation comedy started, with people like Benny and the Sid Caesar show. Light me up. And the sketches got longer and longer, and it kind of elbowed the other stuff out of the way, so that without sort of being aware of it, they had created sitcom. Oh, hungry's a bear. Listen, I tell you what, you know what you ought to do? Uh, I think if, if, if we eat right away, huh? OK, honey, wake up, beef stew? Swell. Mm. <laughs> Gee, honey, you haven't kissed me like that in years. My first experience of situation comedy was somewhere in the early 50s when Ronnie Waldman, who was head of variety at BBC Television, or head of light entertainment at BBC Television, showed us a recording of an American show called Ozzy and Harriet, which was the adventures of a lovable, typical American family. Well, Governor, what's the verdict? Hmm? Oh, it's a delicious lunch, Harriet. Wonderful. No, dear, I met about a front door key for David. Well, if you think so, it's okay with me. Well, I think it's a fine idea. We've got an extra one right over here in the cabinet. Now, you realize what this means, David? Yes, sir, I think so. What does it mean? Okay, David, what does it mean? Oh, he doesn't anybody know? <laughs> and at the end of it, Ronnie switched on the lights and said, well, now, can we do that kind of thing on British television? And with practically one voice, we, the gurus of comedy at that time, said, out of the question. And the reason was because he had made it clear that the great attraction of situation comedy was that the whole audience identified with what was going on in, in them. But in Britain, society was so stratified by class that you could never identify with anybody like that. Now, for one thing, he had his own car. Secondly, he had a double-fronted house. Thirdly, he had a refrigerator, which in those days was like having a private jet. You know, so who would identify with a guy like that? So which class do you choose to pitch a situation comedy? And the first popular British situation comedy was called Life with the Lions. Breakfast ready, dear? Yes, darling. Would you like some toast? Yes, please. There's a slice coming up in a second. Which featured an American family, Bibi Downs and Ben Lyons and their kids, who were the same degree different from every class of British society. Therefore, no one looked down or looked up. I don't know, miss. Somebody phoned up the shop and ordered for flowers suitable for a young girl. Well, I wonder who's sending me flowers. No Life with the Lions had begun on radio, which is also where the first recognisably British sitcom family came into being. Glum by name and glum by nature, they set the tone of British sitcom for the next decade with their weekly sketches in the radio show Take It From Here. Take it from here. I joined Take It From Here in 1953, and when I started, the Glums family started. And this was a quite appalling family, written by Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, and they wrote it as an antidote to all the uh, cosy sitcoms that were on the radio at the time. Pa Glum was played by Jimmy Edwards. Ron, his thicker two plank son, was played by Dick Bentley. And there was Ron's ever loving fiance, Eth. Uh, that was me. Dad, why won't you let me get married? Is it simply for financial reasons? Or has it got something to do with money? <laughs> because, Mr. Glum, if it is just money, we no longer accept that as sufficient objection. We'll manage somehow. 
Love will find a way. I wash. I beg your pardon. I said I wash. Not very often, Dad and Pete. Now then. I really think that uh, Pa Glum was a sort of forerunner of Alf Garnet. That I am not having in this house. Run! Come here! Because he was more or less against everything and for nothing, and I think that was the beginning of the of a change. I'm a happy family man. The first sitcoms on British television took their cue from successful American shows. But the Glums had struck a powerful chord of recognition with a public eager for a sitcom they could call their own. And when audiences heard this sound, they knew it had arrived. BBC Television presents Tony Hancock in... Hancock's Half Hour. Hancock's Half Hour was another sitcom which began life on radio. But by the end of the 50s, it had become a new television phenomenon. The first unmissable sitcom. Good evening, Mrs. Frobisher. <laughs> We're the new babysitters. Oh. Yeah. Who is it, darling? It's the new babysitters. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> May we come in, or would you prefer to bring the baby out here? Well, Tony Hancock, of course, is, uh, you know, I mean, I worshipped him. I impersonated him, tried to impersonate him. I listened to his shows, particularly radio shows, perhaps 30 times each. One went mad for a decade. The best comedy dialogue I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, this is hopeless. Let's face it, you don't like me, do you? No, I don't. Charming. Thank you very much. Took you long enough to find out, didn't it? You've had a dance, a fish supper and a ride home. What more do you want? <laughs> oh, that's nice, isn't it? Casting that up in me face. It wasn't much, was it? I've had better nights. You've seen better days, too, dear. you? <laughs> Sunday afternoon, the Hancock show, when they're all together on a Sunday, all stuck together, they can't get anywhere. It reminded me very much of Sundays in my childhood, when there wasn't much money about. Uh, there were no, very few restaurants, if you could afford to go, which we couldn't. And Sunday afternoon in the rain in Rains Park brought the whole thing back to me. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, dear me. <laughs> Tell me what a life. <laughs> What's the time? Two o'clock. Is that all? Oh dear, oh dear. Oh dear me. I don't know. <sighs> oh, I do hate Sundays. They were trapped in that little house with all their pretensions and their dreams, really. And many, many people still live like that. You <laughs> know, millions live like that. He represented uh, the little man, if you like, not in stature, but the, uh, the underdog or um, somebody that, you know, life had dealt a bit of blow or, or hadn't dealt too many good hands of cards to. <laughs> Now then, can you dance? No. Play a musical instrument? No. Can you interest women conversationally? No. <laughs> can you amuse them? No. Do they laugh at you? Yes. <laughs> In which way? In the worst possible way. With the Hancock character, we tried to bring in all the examples of failure in the human race into one character. Uh, and, uh, you know, the character didn't realise that he was a failure. I shall not go through the facts of this case again, say, to suggest to you there is some element of doubt in this boy's guilt. As Shakespeare said in The Merchant of Vienna... <laughs> he used to bluster around and convince that he was uh, an, an unrecognised genius and that one day the world would recognise him for his true worth. Because what he didn't realise is that the world already recognised what he was. Complete and utter prat. Does Magna Carta mean nothing to you? Did she die in vain? <laughs> Brave Hungarian peasant girl. 
who forced King John to sign the pledge at Runnymede and close the boozers at half past ten. <laughs> You started looking forward to Hancock. Say he went out on th Thursday. You began to think about it on Sunday night. <laughs> You'd think, oh, there'd be another Hancock on Thursday. And I think to probably a greater extent than almost any other comedy show I can remember, people arrange their week round Hancock. Tony Hancock was the first man, actor, to empty the pubs. Now, that is an interesting thing, because, I mean, you know, people sit and want to booze all the evening, but when he came on, Hancock's half hour, the pubs, you know, ten minutes or a quarter of an hour before that, whoosh, the publicans will tell you that he was... They didn't have tellies in pubs in those days, and he would empty the pubs. I mean, that is... What an achievement that was. Well, out your hand, please. One third of the population dashed home to watch Hancock as the blood donor his most unforgettable performance in his finest half hour. It won't hurt. You'll just feel a slight prick on the end of your thumb. The public had taken the bumptious figure of Anthony Aloysius St. John Hancock to its heart. Well, I'll bid you good day, then. Thank you very much. But for Tony Hancock, the man, the relationship with his comic character was turning stale. Where are you going? Have me tea and biscuits. <laughs> I thought you came here to give us some of your blood. Well, you've just had it. <laughs> That's just a smear. It may be just a smear to you, mate, but it's life and death to some poor lips. He would say to us once every two or three years, we've got to go on. We've, we've got to go on. Meaning wants a change, but he had no idea what that change uh, uh, should be or how we were to go on. As far as he was concerned, it had become a noose that was tightening around his neck. He needed to escape. Um, people talk about the bitter battle between Gordon Simpson and he when they broke up. There was no big battle. He wanted them to write something more expansive. They felt that his talent should have been contained in what they did. And that's what happened. It wasn't walking away from being Hancock. It was walking away from Anthony Aloysius. <laughs> his audience never really forgave Tony Hancock for abandoning Anthony Aloysius. Cut loose from the constraints of Galton and Simpson's comic creation, Hancock lurched into terminal decline. The two writers, on the other hand, took the opportunity to steer situation comedy in a dramatically new direction. After writing for Hancock and, and Frankie Howard and uh, other comedians for, uh, well, then it was up to about 12 years, you know, since, since we started, we had this feeling that we'd like to write for actors. You know, the sort, of, the sort of performers who don't count their laughs and don't mind if they've had a couple of pages without a laugh in it, you know. And also the subject matter, we felt we could, we could get more dramatic, you know, if we had actors, certain things you can't do with comedians. And, and Comedy Playhouse was an ideal opportunity. And Ray came up with the idea of the Dragon Bowman. The name Steptoe came from a little, rather Dickensian shop in Richmond. Uh, the shop's called Steptoe and Fig. I think it was something to do with uh, um, uh, photography, you know, probably sepia photographs and brass, brass-bound uh, mahogany cameras. But um, that's that's where the name came from. When we wrote the first one, we didn't know what the relationship was. We were halfway through writing it, we still didn't know who they were and what they were. We were just writing two rag and bowmen arguing. But when the idea came that one of them was older than the other one and that he was his father and son and the son was getting on, that was the curve. That's what made it. Yeah. Dad! Never hear what you're wanting. I'll bet it's at my booze. If I catch him, I'll ram his corkscrew right up his dirty little nose. <laughs> ah! Yeah, yeah, who is he? Help! 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 There's nothing here. I'm only a poor old man. There's no money here. He's selling me in in a minute. Help! I know. You, you wouldn't ask for old ex-service man with only one lung. Help! 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 Oh, oh. I've got gold as you. Oh, you great useless article. What do you want to do that for? Creeping in on me. Nearly gave me arse failure. You done that on purpose. 
I'll do come for some clouds of a gold sight. <laughs> well, Revolting socks, that's a pamounta. <laughs> you look a pamphlet for famine relief. Wilfred Bramble and Harry H. Corbett were both newcomers to television comedy when they were cast as Steptoe and Son. Harry Corbett's stage credentials included a spell at the famous theatre workshop. Its director, Joan Littlewood, had pioneered a new, earthy style of drama, which dispensed with the cut-glass accents and middle-class affectations of traditional theatre. They come in here, the punters come in here, they expect to have a card game, and what happens? They look around, what do they see? You and your bleeding birds in here, lying about... Little wonder, then, that her protégé should find the prospect of playing a rag-and-bone man so appealing. Well, it's your fault, I had uh, met Goldman and Simpson and told them how much I really admired their work, and I really did, and said if ever they felt like writing anything separate from because I never envisaged in a thousand years going over into light entertainment. Uh, I then looked at uh, television, and all I saw that was making any kind of good, what's the word, social comment, though I hate it, was the Hancocks, the Eric Sykes, this kind of half-hour comedy program, you see. And, oh, I did envy them. So they uh, remembered this conversation, obviously, took me at my word, and this thing about the rag and bone men thumped through the door. Um, I read it and immediately wired back, uh, delicious, delightful, cannot wait to work on it. I can remember being introduced as a, as a very young child watching it and thinking it was a drama, because it was not, you know, sort of... Um, sparkly and colourful and glittering characters because it was grim and it was set in a place that was, you know, it was set at their home was just full of junk and it was very depressing and they both looked such a mess. And I thought it was a drama I was watching. Enjoy yourself while you're young. Because when you're old, nobody will worry about you when you're all alone. Oh, you poor old man. You ain't got nothing to live for, have you? Here, cut your throat, <laughs> And I also think what's so fascinating about um, those two characters is that, that father-son thing that, where you can loathe someone because you feel trapped by them and love them because you feel trapped by them. And I just... I, and I, and I, I think as I got older, I understood more and more of what was behind that. And, and now, when I watch them again, they become richer every time. Steptoe was the first sitcom to use actors as opposed to comedians. Be before then, uh, I'm not knocking comedians, but it would always been comic characters in sitcom. Go on, go in. Daddy will have your hot milk all ready for you. And there you had you classically trained actors. Well, and for me, and I think for millions of other people, they simply gave it a new dimension. Oh, come on, Anna, I promise. Hi, uh, I'll tell you again. Come on in. They got depths into it that had never been in the sitcom before. And your old milk. You rotten little skin bag. What have I done wrong now? You lovesome little man, you. You dirty, smelly little pile of nasty. That's no way to speak to your father. Father? Eric was a better father than you are. You knew I had a bird out there, didn't you? Why did you have to humiliate me like that? And also, I mean, the... The anger, the conflict. I mean, everyone says that conflict is an important part of television comedy. But, I mean, they had conflict that nobody had ever seen before. You know, they didn't have a little row about her slimming or him giving up smoking. I mean, there were times when they hated each other in that. You could feel I mean, I remember being actually rather shocked by it. You know, you, you almost sort of jumped back a bit from the screen and went, ah! Alan Ray did, a, did an episode where uh, Wilfred Bramble admitted that... that Harold's mother had been a slag. May I see her? And of course, Harold was absolutely stricken by it. How long has she been there? Um... She has been asleep for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> she was very beautiful. She was. Far too good for him. She was the best look around here. I remember when she used to take me shopping down the high street, how proud I was. All the men used to turn round and look at her. They did more than look at her. You keep your dirty mouth. <laughs> you got my lot of sewer. You're obscene, you are obscene. No, no, now, no, no, that's the no, no, kind no. of dramatic moment that never been seen before in British comedy. And that, I think, that turned it in another direction. I've always said they shouldn't set Pinter for O levels. They should set Gorton and Simpson. I'll be going, Mother. Here you are. 
When are you going to bring that stuff up from the allotment? When I can remember, love. I'll walk down with you, Dad. All right. In the early 60s, the same gritty reality that had seeped into Steptoe and Son became the hallmark of British cinema. Nowhere, it seemed, was grittier than the North, with its cobbled streets, cloth caps and coal dust. And where cinema went, situation comedy followed. The North was so in at the time. I mean, suddenly the media had discovered the North, and Ian came from the far North, the Northeast, which had never been seen on the screen at the time. We were very much influenced by trying to put some of the, the grainy north on the screen that we'd just been watching in kind of loving Saturday night, Sunday morning, loneliness of the long distance drama, that, that kind of thing. And getting away from, it was a reaction away from the traditional film comedy, which tended to be with Donald Sinton and Kenneth Moore in blazers and cravats. It's the same every year, that lunchtime session at work. I don't know why they open the factory Christmas Eve. Mm. Eleven, everybody's over the pub, nobody gets back until three, and then they're half mortal. Eee, I must have had about six pints. Six? You'd have that many before I passed out. Eee, you were well aware. What were you drinking? Rum and pep. I didn't know you drank rum. I don't anymore. <laughs> hey, she was knocking them back in all mind. Oh. Elsie. The canteen girl? Yeah. Who did she end up with? You! <laughs> they were working class. Their parents were working class. Anything there? They didn't really have great expectations of moving beyond the town and the landscape and the, uh, and the profession that their parents were in. And Although slowly, Bob began to have... But that developed dream, in the later that, 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 that developed, it didn't you know, But Bob had a certain kind of romanticism, which he knew that there was a world outside that, and Terry really didn't. I've been to RADA, and at RADA I, I thought um, I didn't speak with an accent at all. And I always remember being told to say, blood, um, so that I'd stop saying blood. Um, but I could speak quite good when I left Rada, and every part I got was from the north again. So I had to relearn it all. All systems go! Three, two, one, blast off! All the locations of the north were Wilsdon Junction. Wilsdon Junction is about two miles from the television centre at Shepherd's Bush, and we found a location that was a row of back-to-back -back houses, just like you find in the north with the little backyards and the little lavatories by the, the alleyway right down the middle, and at the end of the alleyway was a line of railway sleepers and then a grassy bank and a canal. You ain't got the north, need you? Rocker was a wonderful plot, actually, which I think that was based on something we'd read in the paper. I mean, I, I drove a scooter around about that time, and I remember taking the test, and, and it didn't happen to me, but I heard the story of, of how you you know, the, the instructor doesn't come on the back of the bike with you. He stands somewhere on the route, and at some point he's going to step out into the road and say, stop. And uh, it seemed to us that that was a marvellous situation for a, for a bit of Bob and Terry. <laughs> Terry is trying to help Bob pass his driving test, so he said he wanted to help him practice emergency stops. <laughs> Since that episode, I must have been told 300 stories of uh, that happening to people. One of the nicest things people in the street say to me is, um, it was just like us. Bob and Terry were just like us. As the 60s started to swing, a new and restless generation began to make itself heard, first in pop music, then in politics. Labour's 1964 election victory opened the door to sweeping social change, but old straight-laced Britain refused to lie down quietly. Each week, the two generations locked horns in a tiny East End living room and fought to a standstill. See, and Mr. McMillan, see, we was having it too good, wasn't no, we? Either. We was enjoying our flesh pots too much, <laughs> wasn't we? 
And he saw this, he saw it, and in his infinite wisdom, he sent down a plague upon us, a pestilence, a scourge throughout the land. In the name of your arrow, bloody Wilson! What we did was introduce subjects that hadn't been discussed on television before, and, def and certainly not in situation comedy. That was uh, sex, politics and religion. I mean, I think well, what was so brilliant is that uh, Johnny Spate, who wrote it, was a devotee of George Bernard Shaw because of Shaw's political, polemic, uh, wonderful discussions that take place in his plays. But where Shaw did it with, through the mouths of quite articulate people, um, Johnny Spate did it in the mouths of four idiots. That's the last time that paper comes in this house! <laughs> No, you don't want to read it, neither. Bloody Labour rag, bloody anti-British rag. Oh, what are you talking about? Traitorious statements, that's what I'm talking about. Traitorious statements. <laughs> Look. Hey. Look. <laughs> read that. Look. A tiny offshore island. That's a Great Britain oh, they're I alluding at there, isn't it? Great Britain, offshore island. Off what bloody shore, eh? Off the what shore? God, oh, bloody. No longer a fourth division wall power. Bloody cheap. This is where the fictional elf Garnet lives. This is where I set it. Canning Town in the east end of London. People often accuse me of creating Elf Garnet. I didn't. Society created him. I just reported him. I thought he needed reporting. I'm a grass. Johnny Spate was a product of the East End. He lived in Canning Town, worked in factories, sold insurance. And it always struck Johnny as funny that his father, who was a, a, an a Irish origin docker in the East End of London, who was as poor as they come, that he should be voting Tory and be an ardent fan of Her Majesty and the Tory party. All the people who, well, not Her Majesty, I beg your pardon, Mom, not her, but the Tory party certainly would be intent upon keeping Mr Spate Senior where he belonged, at the bottom of the heap. Uh, Cuppies, Cuppies, go to the dogs. Go right down the drain, it is. That's yeah, well, just a minute, just a minute. That's your 13 years of Tory misrule. That's what's done that. Ah, don't listen. It's nothing. Get over there. <laughs> Nothing to do with that, mate, is it? It's your Labour Party. I mean, listen, look at your last Commonwealth conference, eh? Hey? Look at that. I mean, look, in the old days, mate, when them coons come over oh, here... that's nice, isn't it? They was give their instructions what to go back and do, wasn't they? But not today, though, is it? Eh? God oh, blimey, no, they... They come over here, don't they? They come over here and tell us what to do. And your darling Harold, he sits there and takes it. Oh, blimey. I mean, if that had been, if that had been old Winnie Churchill up there, mate, what? He'd have soon told them Laskers where to get off. Oh. <laughs> get back to your own country, you'd have told them. Get, your, get back to the jungle, get your blimmin' drums out. <laughs> Racism was never talked about on television before. It was there, but it was hidden. It was, uh, I mean, it was talked about in private. Nobody actually... This is what people discussed in, uh, they said, uh, in the pubs and all, but nobody actually said it openly. We said it openly. <laughs> there are people like Alf Garnet who actually say these dreadful things. What's the coon doing here? <laughs> I've given blood the same as that. What do you mean, for other coons, like? <laughs> no, for anyone. Huh? I mean, they bung his blood into anybody? Yeah. Why not? Why not? How do you do? <laughs> I think that society was changing. I think that people were becoming aware of black people being here. Um, and I think that people were frightened of it. Um, uh, because we were here. And what did that mean to them, to their lives? Were their daughters safe? Um, and I think that the presence of black people uh, in that way affected the way the English felt about themselves. And in something like Till Death Us Do Part, what you saw was 
sort of rabid paranoia about the loss of the greatness that was this country. Look, Enoch Powell, on a point of information, yes. was the first one who brought the wolves over. He, wanted, he was the first one to extend the hand of friendship to your coons. He brought them over no. expressly to, to, to run our railways for us, sweep our roads, look after our public conveniences. Oh, and he was happy and content to do that until your bloody Labour lot started banging her ideas, their ideas in her head, daft bloody ideas and unsettling them all. Ideas of human dignity. Ideas above their bloody station. And equality. Look, you start giving them a bit of equality, next thing you know, they bloody will oh, demand it. Of course, your Labour lot can't leave well alone, no. Stuffing their heads full of daft ideas about being doctors and surgeons. And now the bloody transport's gone to pot. And it ain't safe to go into hospital anymore, not with them bloody lot in there. <laughs> you have to take it in context. And obviously, if it was in the context of saying this man is right, and we do believe his opinions, then obviously that would be deeply disgusting. But that wasn't what Spate was doing. This wasn't comedy brutalising the people that Garnet was brutalising. In a way, it was brutalising Garnet. Garnet was the victim of Spate's genius. He showed this very sad man with his endless ignorance, propping himself up with the sad emptiness of his, of his, his half-formed opinion. <laughs> You said he was born in Manchester, so yeah, he, yeah. Well, he ain't a proper blackie then, is he? Brilliantly performed, wonderfully written. And not everything that's good is a watershed, changes things. Uh, that isn't a definition of being good at all. But on this occasion, it, it was a watershed, and, and uh, Till Death is a Part did change things. I mean, the ones that I'm talking about, they're your proper blacks, aren't they? The ones that was born in a jungle, your natives. I mean, don't tell me they're educated. Half of them are still eating each other. <laughs> Racism, intolerance and outrage. Till Death Us Do Part's savage satire changed the face of television. Sitcoms suddenly seemed subversive, even dangerous, particularly if they dared to mention the war. This is BBC One. Who do you think you are kidding, Mr Hitler? It was timely. Um, I don't think we could have done it much earlier, really, because uh, the war was, I think, uh, too fresh in the minds then. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was the right time to do it. Where in fact, um, it was amazing somebody else hadn't got, caught the same idea, really. When we met up, we hadn't written together, we didn't know each other very well. And I was putting together the first episode of Dad's Army. I'd got the idea, and I thought, now, how am I going to do this? What sort of comedy setup? And that Sunday afternoon, showing on television, was Oh Mr. Porter, with Will Hay and Moore Marriott, Graham Moffat, the old man, the boy, and the pompous man. Hey, there's an old carriage over there, but I don't think it'll roll. I mean, everything on this station is either too old or it won't work. And you're both. Go on, roll the pair of you. Go on. And I thought, that's it. Old man, young boy, and a pompous man. The BBC controller, Paul Fox, was worried about it because he thought we were taking the mickey out of England's finest hour. So we all assembled in, in uh, Broadcasting House and uh, we showed it to an audience of 250 and they were not allowed to talk to each other. They all had things to write on and, and, and make their comments. And 90% of the people in that room hated it. One woman said, Oh, I don't think it's funny, all those old men. I've oh, just told me forgot about the war, isn't it gone? And so all they do is talk about the war, talk about the war. And three nights this went on, and I was dying. The best we got was one little man who said, well, I quite liked it, but aside from that, I'm afraid we... Uh, well, I'd suppressed the, the evidence, actually, and, and didn't let anyone see the results, and uh, we, we went ahead just the same. I was 48, and I suppose the character was 70-odd. If you're playing an old soldier, the more wars you've been in, the more you, you know about it. So, I mean, I had been in the army. I went in the army in 1941 and ended up in the prisoner of war camp in Austria. I just showed him the cold steel, sir. It never fails. Hey, don't lock it up on me, no, sir. Hey, don't lock it up. <laughs> One of the things about playing Corporal Jones, having been a prisoner of war for four years, it was a sort of revenge in a funny sort of way. So it gave me an added, oh, you know. That Hitler, you know, woo. Well, there's only one thing to do, we must grill him. Over a slow fire, that's all. Can I make them talk, sir? We did that in the Sudan. In the Sudan, we've done that, sir. Oh, pull yourself together, Corporal. Not savages. And of course, uh, working with Arthur Lowe, he was such a good actor. When you did a scene with him, he was so sort of real. It wasn't like acting at all. You just, 
you know, you, it, it was wonderful to do. Do you mind, uh, do you mind, George, if I, if I have a little peep? Oh, <laughs> not like that. You're not going to do it at all. You tap the muzzle of the rifle, and the man brings his gun and his foot round. So, uh, there. Like that, you see? I see, sir, yes. I'll show you how to do it. As far as Dad's arm is concerned and Captain Mannering, we're really back to pomposity again. Because it's terribly pompous. But the most wonderful thing is pomposity being deflated. When his cap goes to one side and he ends up with his glasses like... <laughs> It's, that's wonderful, wonderful comedy. His great quality, I think, was outrage. He would be, he was a great bridler. He bridled a lot. Judas. <laughs> I beg your pardon? Judas! <laughs> I'm awfully sorry, but I don't quite follow you. It was class again. It was a bank manager facing a public schoolboy. It was wonderful, because John LeMessure was, the, as my mother would say, was the real thing, because my mother was a bit of a snob. <laughs> and, uh, but Arthur is a very small part-time bank manager and he's livid that all that the other guy presumably had all the advantages. So you get that wonderful conflict between those two, I think, very funny. We weren't really aware of it being a success or it's becoming a cult or whatever as, as we were going on. We, we realised it was becoming popular. But I suppose it was things like suddenly realising that that episode was nothing to do with the war. Oh, Oh, very nice to see you. I think we have met before. I th I th when Arthur played his own brother, an awful travelling, drunken travel salesman, wonderful performance. It was only set in the war. It was nothing to do with the Home Guard or the war. He could do it about the conflict between those two, that whole family thing going on. And the war was purely background. But the episode could have been in anything. It was about two characters. What floor is this then? <laughs> That's when we started to realise, oh, David and Jimmy feel they can write about things that don't have to have any reference to the Home Guard or the war in at all, really. And that's when we realised, oh, it's made it. We've made it, whatever you want to say, but it has made it. It's, it's, it's a show in its own right. Today, sitcoms have not just realism and emotional depth, but a frankness that would have been unimaginable in the days of Hancock, or even till death us do part. Can we, um, have a problem? Sorry, no? Um, how can I put this, um, nicely? Um, the garage doors are open, but the car doesn't seem to want to come up the drive. <laughs> to get the stiff-lipped British to laugh at bedroom antics took a sea change in attitudes which began with a sexual revolution at the end of the 1960s. And as fashions went from pinstripe to candy stripe, so sitcoms followed suit. The whole liberal feeling had swept the country. It was really England swings and all that. It really had some effect. People kind of straightened up and felt good and looked good and clothing became important and decor became important and fashion designers became famous. And uh, the laws on homosexuality and, and prostitution changed. So the mood swung from the dour and the black and white and the working class to generation gap comedy where my teenage daughter doesn't understand me, but I don't understand my teenage daughter. I don't like her boyfriend. Well... The 70s were terrific. I mean, I always say now, when I think of the 70s, it was a golden time. I suppose people, when they get middle-aged, like me, get a bit nostalgic. <laughs> and they all say, when I was young. But it was true. It was a fantastic time to be young. You felt as if you were very free, having a wonderful time, and that the world was your oyster. Great fun in those early days. It was all, it was adventures. <laughs> hey, you need a comb up. As we will see in part two, 70s sitcoms eagerly embraced all the colour, daring and excitement of the new decade. I'm ever so glad about Beryl. So am I. we still got... We've still got 55 minutes. Attitudes were changing, morals were loosening, and innuendo was positively rampant. They're probably going out to dinner. They're probably having it now. So why aren't we? <laughs> and part two is at 10 o'clock next Wednesday. <laughs>